All right, we will go ahead and st get started as we have a lot to cover today. So first of all, welcome everyone to day four of Splatfest. We're so excited that you are here. Uh, my name is Amanda Bakker and I'm a product marketing manager here at Email on Acid. Today we have a great session on email accessibility and we're gonna help give you tips on how to make your emails more inclusive to all the subscribers on your list. Uh, before I hand it over to our speakers, I just have a couple of housekeeping items I wanna go over. First of all, we are recording the session as well as live streaming it. So we will send the link out um, after the session to everyone that's attended. Um, and then make sure you stay till the very end as we're gonna be doing some fun giveaways at the end and we will draw names and announce the winner, winners at the end of the session. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Elise and Anne to introduce themselves and get started. Are we all set, Amanda? Yes. Okay, perfect. So yes, yeah, stick around for um, the announcement of the winners. Um, nice to meet all of you. Uh, my name is Elise Georgeson and I'm a product designer here at Email on Acid. And I am really excited um, to talk to you today about one of my favorite subjects. Um, empathy and accessibility and inclusion in email. And I'm even more thrilled um, that I get to be a co-presenter with Anne. Yeah. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Anne Tomlin. I'm a freelance email developer under the company I founded called Emails Y'all. And I'm excited to be here with y'all and to give some great tips on accessibility. All right, great, let's jump into it. But before we do, I have a little story. So I used a magic eight ball yesterday to try and find the best email service. Does anybody have any idea what it came back with? <laughs> <laughs> well, all it was tell me, all it would tell me was Outlook was not good. So <laughs> I thought that'd be a fun little way to, to, to kick off our presentation here today. Um, but let's go through the, the table of contents. So we're going to be talking about what is accessibility and why is it important. Um, email is an extension of your brand experience. Tactical ways to make your email accessible, and Anne is going to walk us through that. Um, what would an accessibility presentation be without empathy and story moments? And then um, how inclusivity impacts your brand reputation. So without further ado, what is accessibility and why is it important? So accessibility has, um, has many different kinds of definitions and these definitions can range from very general um, to very technical, um, different types of, of standards. And, um, you know, generally when people think about uh, accessibility, um, it's related to people with impairments and disabilities. But um, in my mind, it's really simply designing so that everyone has the ability to access the experience that you have created for them. So you'll very much hear this as a theme throughout our presentation, this idea of all encompassing design um, and not necessarily just designing for people, you know, specifically with disabilities. So there are a ton of stats surrounding accessibility. And so that's why it makes really great sense to kind of start off with some of these, these numbers, just so we can kind of see the, the breadth. So more than 61 million Americans have physical or mental disabilities, both temporary and impairment. And we're gonna be talking about more of that today as well, um, temporary and permanent and what, you know, what temporary means. Um, but that's roughly one in four people in the United States alone. Um, worldwide, 285 million people have vision differences, 36 million are blind, 246 million have low vision or color blindness. And so um, when we take a look at it through those lens, these numbers are just too big to ignore. Um, 
And then we recently did uh, did a little study here. Um, so, you know, this question of, do you consider email accessibility factors such as color contrast, screen readers, and ADA compliance? compliance. And our email marketers responded with 57% um, said yes, that they do consider all of these things, but there's a huge gap on the other side. So only 24% said they sometimes consider it. And then almost 20% said no, not at all. So um, I also wanted to call out that, that this um, piece of information here, this this chart is um, on a blog on the email on ACID website. The blog is called Email Accessibility Guide, Best Practices for Marketers. Um, and it's, it's a very long blog, but it's packed with a ton of really great information. Um, and that includes um, more numbers surrounding accessibility, um, why accessible email, email support marketing strategy, accessibility standards by industry. So we've actually broken down some of the industries for you um, and then touch upon, you know, what, what compliance, um, you know, or guidelines exist there, um, best practices in design and code, um, and then tools and resources. And we'll be talking about some of that today as well, but please go check out that blog, Email Accessibility Guide, Best Practices for Marketers. Um, which leads really well into our next section. Um, email is an extension of your brand experience. And I know many of you know this. It, it maybe is one of the most important extensions of your brand experience. So when you think about that in the lens of accessibility, take, a, take for example, an email that's fully accessible. And it might be the difference between, you know, a purchase or a new membership subscription or somebody that just decides to disengage with your brand completely because of an inaccessible email. So the next slide here really talks about this idea of design thinking. Um, and, and this is really um, close to what I do in, in product design um, because we you know, utilize this methodology almost every day. And I think it makes absolute sense to think about this um, when you're developing your email strategy as well. So it's, um, it's broken down into three main buckets, understanding our customer and subscriber base, exploring, and then materializing. So the first step and what we're talking about today in our presentation is really empathizing with your customer and subscriber. Um, understanding them, conducting that research to develop um, to develop all of those nuances of who your customer base uh, is. Next is defining. So you know, after you've done your listening, you've probably pinpointed some pain points um, that exist. Um, and so you know, it's it's kind of writing writing the problems down that ex that exist and and observing. Um, and then the next step is ideating. So, you know, from what, you know, your research, you're then taking what you've learned and, and you're putting together um, maybe, you know, some different ideas on maybe how to approach your email customer journey. Um, maybe it's, um, you know, some different ways that you could, you know, start to um, include uh, different customer bases, segmentation, this is the fun brainstorming part of design thinking. So then we get a little bit more tactile and, and realistic. So we're actually prototyping and, and building, um, building things out at this point. So maybe that would be laying out um, different, different layouts, different content or imagery in, in your emails, um, and then testing, testing those with real users. So even when we're thinking about accessibility, um, people that have all kinds of human differences, you know, maybe, maybe you're actually putting the email in front of them and, and asking them what they think. Um, getting real feedback is so important. Um, and then you get to implement and put everything you've learned into this mitigated kind of risk adverse 
um, release or, or launch so that hopefully you're putting the best possible solution in front of your subscribers or users. Um, and this is cyclical. So you just keep evolving um, and learning and starting the process over um, as you can kind of see, you know, where, where some of your gaps are. So let's do the research and then test, test, test with your customer or subscriber base. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about here is this idea of Keller's brand equity model. Um, and I, th I think this makes a ton of sense when we start to talk about email being an, an extension of your brand. And think about this with our topic of accessibility. And again, what a fully accessible or even partially accessible email means in relationship to this brand equity model. So the logic behind this is really simple. Um, you know, it just basically refers to having a strong brand and, you know, one must create the right image and um, construct these ideal brand encounters at every touch point, how, how it's just very vital and important to your brand in making sure you're consistent um, in that bottom one, the salience or identity of who you are, making sure those perceptions are correct at the key stages of the, the buying or engaging um, process, whatever that looks like for your company um, or brand. The second tier is meaning. So what are you? And that, that really refers to the performance. So it defines how well your brand meets your customers' needs, you know, whether that's product reliability, um, serviceability, service effectiveness, empathy, style and design and price, you know, and again, accessibility needs to be um, included in that, um, as well as imagery. Um, and that, you know, falls under the inclusion umbrella too, you know, that the imagery that you use in your um, brand campaigns and emails really affect your customers on a social and psychological level. Number three is response. What about you? Um, so this is your customer's response to your brand and it falls into these two ca categories of judgments and feelings. So, um, you know, this is, this is how your customers and subscribers um, are, are perceiving you. So are they perceiving you um, with credibility? Um, do they trust you? Are you likable? Um, what about the quality of your, of your brand? So that could be based upon actual or just um, perceptive qualities. And then are you considering their needs? Um, and then superiority, how do you stack up next to your competitors? And then the final one, and you know, that's kind of the most important one and how attached your customers and subscribers are. It's that behavioral loyalty. What about you and me? What does our relationship look like? So this could include, you know, you know, regular and repeat purchases. Um, your customers loving your brand and your product and and um, really having that attitudinal attachment. Um, it also includes sense of community, which is important, um, you know, with, with social media and um, loyalty programs, um, active engagement. Do they feel like, you know, they're a part of your community? Do they feel included? Um, and then active engagement. So that's them, you know, actually evangelizing your brand. Um, talking to their, their friends and family, um, word of mouth, social media, following your brand. Um, all of these things tie back to accessibility um, because if they're feeling like their needs are not met, um, you know, the pyramid kind of starts to deteriorate. So I think these are all great things to keep in mind. Um, and now we're going to talk about tactical ways to make your email accessible. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Anne, our email guru, to walk you through this section. Great, thanks Elise. Um, so like Elise said, um, email accessibility is based on the goal that your email should be usable and readable for all subscribers, including those with disabilities. But accessibility isn't just for those with 
visual differences. Your campaign should be easily consumable by those with mobility impairments, cognitive differences, and psychological disabilities, as well as people of different ages, cultures, and so on. So to put it simply, accessibility benefits everyone. So on this next slide, there we go. All right, awesome. Say it benefits everybody. So for example, uh, you should always add alt text to your images so that screen readers will read the alt text that describes each image. This benefits us all because some email clients block images on load. So if there's alt text, your subscriber will still get your message even without the images. So uh, the accessibility is also a team effort. Uh, no single department is responsible for it. Every department should be involved in email creation, including strategy, copywriting, design, and coding. And everybody should be well-versed in accessibility standards and best practices. So like, for example, uh, strategy generates the plan and holds everybody accountable. Copywriting ensures that the message is easily understood by each reader. Design optimizes the layout and images to maximize the email's impact. And coders do the technical stuff to remove the roadblocks that prevent the message from being consumed. The whole team should really work together to give the message the best chance of, excuse me, of reaching the subscriber. So on the next slide, we'll talk about accessibility in code. So first, you want to define the language that your email is in by adding lang equals en to the HTML tag. En here is English. If your email is in like Spanish, you'd use es for Espanol. So you can easily find a list of language abbreviations on the web to help you. Uh, you also need to have the ARIA tag role equals presentation on all of your tables that contain content. This tells the screen reader that they need to read out the content that follows. You should always also have role equals button on all your buttons because it will activate, or excuse me, it will alert the screen reader that there's a control present and that an action is gonna be taken if the button is like activated. So next you need to use semantic markup like headers, like H1, H2 and paragraph tags. So using this markup helps screen readers put emphasis in the right places and read the document in the correct order. It's best practice to have P ta uh, tags, paragraph tags around every block of text and not use break tags or if you're using a WYSIWYG, like hurt, um, hit the return button. It's not always possible to do this though with the tools that we have, so uh, unless you were hand coding. So don't stress out if you have to use break tags. So when you need to create a list, this is important, uh, ordered or unordered, you need to use UL or OL tags to make the list accessible. So the reason why is that keyboards, uh, keyboard users can jump from item to item in the list this way. But if you use table cells, you're adding unnecessary roadblocks to consuming the email. When you use table cells to create a list, the screen reader will actually read out the word bullet and then the text. If you use the UL or OL tags though, the screen reader will read each list item without saying bullet. So let's, uh, for example, say that I use tables to construct the ordered, unordered list on this slide. It would sound like this, bullet add lang equals open parentheses en close parentheses to the HTML tag bullet, use ARIA tags, et cetera. So it just, it, it, Definitely is not the smooth uh, interaction as uh, it would have if you use the UL or OL tags. So uh, next, we all like big buttons and we cannot lie. In mobile, uh, most people tap with their thumb 
So your buttons need to be at least 44 pixels tall. So that's enough space for your subscribers to activate the button and not accidentally tap uh, anything else around the button. You also wanna make your buttons full width in mobile because you need to make it as easy for everyone, especially those with motor uh, control impairments to click without any obstacles. So this next one needs a little explaining. Uh, there is nothing wrong with using all caps in emails, but what you should avoid is typing in all caps because some screen readers will read out the letters, not the words. I kind of showed you that one on the, when we were talking about the um, uh, screen reader reading out, uh, you know, a, use A-R-I-A -A tags. So it, it does that sometimes. Uh, so if you actually type in the um, capital letters. So you want to use text transform uppercase instead. So on the next slide, I got to get up on my soapbox for this next one. You got to use live text. Live text is actual text that you have typed into the template. The opposite of live text is called baked in text and refers to text that is part of an image. Always, always, always use live text. Flashy designs that require text to be part of an image is bad practice. Retaining your brand font is not a valid reason to use baked in text. If you don't use live text to get your message across, you're leaving money on the table and worse, you're telling part of your audience that you care more about your font than you do about them. So live text is best practice and always shows up in email, even when images are blocked. So similarly, you always wanna set and style alt text on your images. That alt text needs to be unique and relevant to the image that it's on. So you wanna style your alt text so that it looks like part of your brand if people end up seeing it. So like this line of code at the bottom of the slide shows the styling of an image's alt text. So here we're setting a font family, a font size and the color of the text. It also includes a background color so that it's even more obvious if an image is missing. So there will be a, be a big, you know, colorful box that says, ah, oh, there should be an image here. So uh, be careful though that your font color is readable on top of whatever background color you choose. So it's my personal experience that setting a line height on either the image or the containing TD will cause your image to only be as tall as the line height in Outlook. So you could end up with an image this tall. So why am I so passionate about live text, uh, live text and alt tags? Let's go to the next uh, slide. Awesome. So this is an email that I opened up in Gmail. It has some images of clothes for sale, icons, buttons, trying to sell me some jeggings. Looks pretty decent, right? Next slide. This is why we can't have nice things. It's totally possible to create everything in this email by using HTML. Setting aside that there is no live text at all and everything is an image, the alt text for every single image is exactly the same. Turn your images on, shop AEO. Do you know what this email would sound like to a person using a screen reader? Turn your images on, shop AEO. 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 Imagine hearing that another 19 times. How frustrating must it be to use a screen reader and all you wanna do is buy some jeans? So this email did not have to be this way. It could have included everyone with just a small amount of work. So on the next slide, we'll talk about the design aspects of email accessibility. You need to think about contrasting colors. 
This is especially important for those with color blindness and for seniors. I don't know about you, but my eyes are hurting already trying to read that white text on the gray background in the image on the right. You want to make your text as legible as possible for everyone, and it takes seconds to adjust your colors to employ more contrast. Maybe bring it up with the people who manage your brand guidelines. Also, as a quick tip, uh, as we age, blue and green fade to gray. So use those colors sparingly if you're uh, specifically targeting seniors. Next, you want to avoid true black and true white because they can cause a halo effect for some people. From what I understand, it's similar to how street lights can look that have the, the halo around them. So instead, use colors that are a little bit off true black and a little bit off true white. So uh, just as alt tags needs to be descriptive, so does your link text. Click here and learn more. You need to get rid of those. They are not descriptive at all. If someone is scanning your email, they have no clue where they are going if they click here. This is especially true of buttons. The average email attention span is five to seven seconds. So use specific link text like download the white paper, send some flowers, shop the sale, things like that. So you also need to make links look like links. From the beginning of the internet, an underlined bit of text in a uh, different color than the text around it has denoted a link. I know it's popular uh, right now to make a link a different color and just call it a day. But think about this. Colorblind people will not always be able to distinguish a link from the text around it if, it's ju if just the color is different. So you might think that changing the color and bolding the link is enough, but it's not enough because bolding is mostly used for emphasis, not links. So you really need to underline your links to be inclusive of your entire audience. And uh, might just, I mean, do all three, make it underlined, different color and bold. That, that'll be super, you know, get your attention. Text size is very important. So you should be using a font size of no less than 14 pixels for desktop and 16 pixels for mobile. I'd like to just combine those two and say, you should not be using font sizes less than 16. And yes, visible preheaders, footers, and legal text are included in that statement. Every bit of your text in your email should be legible. When you use like nine or 10 pixel fonts, you're creating a roadblock for your whole audience uh, to read the entirety of your message. That's the opposite of accessibility and inclusion. Uh, you also need to use a line height that is at least four pixels more than the font size. So let's say you have an email with uh, text at 16 pixels, you need a line height of 20 pixels or more. And a quick tip, using percentages for line height is usually easier. So uh, lastly, you want, need to align your text to either side of the screen, depending on what language your text is in. So taking English as an example, you should always align your paragraphs to the right because paragraphs of center aligned text is difficult to read for those with dyslexia. Headings and uh, one or two short, short sentences are totally okay to center align but not large blocks of text, not huge paragraphs. So on the next slide, uh, Lise is going to show y'all how email on ACID can help your accessibility game. Lise.
Lisa, I think you're still on mute, maybe. Uh-oh, can everybody still see the presentation okay? Amanda, can everyone still see the presentation okay? Now we can see it, great, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Yes, so I'm excited to talk to you next about what email on ACID can offer in terms of accessibility. Um, so we have here setting up code for screen readers, um, presentation roles, removing alt attributes, set alt text, adjust contrast ratio, enhance link accessibility, and review using Zoom. Um, so Testing your email um, in multiple email clients is always preferred before sending. Um, an email on ACID will give you just an idea of how accessible your email is um, with its automated features. So really easy, um, really easy and efficient to just kind of walk you through each one of those steps um, and fix your email quickly. So now we're going to dive into some empathy and story moments. Um, and I was really intentional about picking these images. Um, and again, you know, maybe not what we would typically think of, um, but really showcases uh, our subscribers and customers in all kinds of different um, environments and situations and how they're digesting um, our content. So, you know, especially with COVID, people kind of wanting to get a break um, from being inside, people are taking a look at, um, and, at your content and, and working more outside. So really making sure that color contrast is optimized. Here we see an older gentleman who's um, on his mobile device um, and, you know, wanting to make sure that our, um, our font sizes are correct. Um, just considering, you know, all types of different situations. So next we have some um, actual uh, accessibility stories here. Um, and this is a story from DeCue, who's, you know, one of the, the leaders in accessibility and um, definitely a company that I refer to when um, I'm looking for tips and tricks or the latest going on in accessibility. Um, so Ryan is a teacher who teaches computer and braille at Blind Incorporated. Um, and his, you know, kind of goal is to give, you know, people back that literacy. Um, so when they come into the program, they learn how to use the internet and start working on, you know, on email and start working on um, or looking at, you know, e-commerce and, and shopping. Um, and so they can see all these kind of crazy things pop up, um, you know, is what he kind of talks about. And it can be really frustrating and difficult to see. And he puts it in a nice frame of mind here when he says, you know, some people who go blind later on in life um, don't know what accessibility is, and they don't know what inaccessibility is. They just remember that being sighted and using the internet and computer was an easy thing for them to do. This next one is Paul, and he says here that you shouldn't assume, don't assume that people, that people all experience your email in the way that you do. Um, so Paul is another advocate for accessibility. Um, but what some people don't know is that he's lived with epilepsy since childhood. Um, and he spent, he says, you know, most of his life avoiding everything and anything that has, you know, the potential to trigger a seizure. Um, and that could be extreme stress to um, strobe lights. Maybe it's a flickering image. Um, so, you know, when he receives emails that contain animated GIFs that flicker or flash, it's an immediate delete for him. Um, and he talks about how he just simply can't risk his health because of an email. 
Um, this next accessibility story is Donna, and she works at Microsoft. And I just noticed as of this month, she was named um, director of a uh, director of technology, specifically Microsoft accessibility. Um, and she says here, I don't want anyone to feel like they don't belong or can't succeed in tech because they have a disability. Um, and she has dyslexia. And, and she talks about, you know, many pe people having, um, you know, this feeling that they need to hide it because they don't want to look incompetent. So she feels like it's kind of, you know, one of her responsibilities to represent others. Um, and she kind of says, because if somebody, you know, she doesn't understand something, there's probably at least one other person in the room who also doesn't understand it. Um, and so she advocates for, you know, wanting to design for all different kinds of people um, to and building products for all different kinds of customers. This is Luke. Um, and he talks about how email presents a challenge for him when there's no web alternative. Um, this idea of clicking here to view in your browser. So not all mail apps support font resizing or allow saving to, uh, to a reader app such as Insta, uh, Paper or Pocket. And so low, low vision people have to make, make do or read on a computer. And there are a lot of vision disabilities in his family, he says, you know, myself included. Um, so sometimes e email again just gets deleted if they're not designed with low vision in mind. So this quote here, by making the choice to not include users, you are impacting your users' choices. Um, which leads really nicely into our next um, area or topic here, inclusivity impacts um, on, your, on your brand. Um, so looking here at inclusivity and accessibility and, and the difference. So inclusivity, um, you know, they're both closely associated, um, but inclusivity really looks at traits or identification such as, you know, but not limited to ethnicity, race, or gender. Um, accessibility can include degrees of impairments, again, such as sight, mobility, or learning disability. Um, but accessibility really focuses on the outcome or the end result of a design project, whereas inclusive design is closely related to accessibility, but it's rather an outcome and a methodology for how to approach design. Um, and this idea that designing for a variety of ways people can participate and feel a sense of belonging is incredibly important in inclusivity. Um, it doesn't mean that you're just designing one thing for all people. It's designing a diversity of ways to participate so everyone has a sense of belonging. So if you then, you know, consider the full range of human diversity um, with respect to, you know, such things as language, culture, gender, age, and just other forms of human differences, you know, bringing that empathy um, back into play. So maybe just trying things, you know, taking again, accessibility and inclu inclusivity are, it's not just a project, it really is a process, but, you know, by starting, you know, by leaving the presentation and um, trying one or two new things, um, you're already, you know, getting started on this track. So considering things like, you know, pronouns, trying they and them, Think about connotation and how you're speaking to people. Um, thinking about imagery and making sure it's diverse and representative of all of your subscribers and customer base. Um, race and ethnicity, even reading level. So are you speaking to people in a way that, you know, all of your subscribers will easily understand um, what you're trying to communicate? Um, segmentation. So this might mean that you've got a little bit of, you know, you have to do a little bit more heavy lifting and how you're thinking, um, you know, and, and sending out to your um, customer base. 
ask for feedback. Um, you know, if you're not feeling certain about something, you know, your a direction that you're going, ask ask somebody. You know, am am I Am I being offensive here? Does this resonate or make sense? Um, you know, is this representative of my subscribers and not just this overall general demographic? Um, language equity is really important. So when we recognize that our subscribers, um, you know, should be able to consume our messages uh, in the language that they're most comfortable with, they're automatically going to feel a sense of belonging. Um, and again, if it is offensive, they're not going to come back. Um, you've lost that potential subscriber or maybe even that loyal subscriber. Um, so taking a look and eliminating exclusivity. So it's, it's making sure you are identifying those cases um, and embracing those as opportunities. You know, we, we live in this culture now where people can be forgiving and just being transparent and, and apologizing. Um, and thinking about, uh, about the communication strategy. Again, if you haven't guessed from this presentation, we are all human and we, we make mistakes. Um, so some great tools for inclusivity. Um, this is one of my favorites. I just found it. It's called Cards for Humanity. Um, and you click on that deal a new pair and it'll pair um, a specific uh, trait um, and, uh, you know, maybe a struggle or a need that this particular person um, is dealing with that at any moment in time. So it allows you to, um, when you click on that view needs, um, it'll then turn on the backside representation on the right there um, about what you need to consider in designing for this person. And what I love about this is it, it really shows you the whole person um, instead of just, you know, an assumption about someone or, um, you know, may, maybe something that's, you know, not quite inherent that, that these are your subscribers and customers. Um, some other great tools are Hemingway app. So again, you know, if you're curious about um, reading level and how your content is, is being read, Hemingway app will then tell you, you know, right away where your content is tracking. Um, and then gender decoder is another really good one. So it'll show you how masculine or feminine um, your content is leaning in that way. So I think we're at the question stage. Amanda, do you have any questions for us? Yes, we have a few. The first one's from Marie and she would like to know if she's using the content block builder in her ESP and does not have access to the HTML code, would she just assume that the ESP has accessibility guidelines um, built in? Uh, not necessarily. Um, some ESPs are, are better at this than others. Um, I would say you can do a, you know, some, some search, uh, but I mean, you're, you're limited by your, um, you know, by the tools that you have to use. So, I mean, it's, while this is, it's, you want to strive for accessibility, uh, you know, it's sometimes you just can't using the, the tools that um, you're given. Uh, but like I said, some ESPs are better uh, at this than, than others. Thanks, Anne. So the next question is how detailed should the alt text be? For example, photo of a roller coaster with a lime green track. A lime green track. The writers are upside down on a loop. One writer has their hands in the air. The words fun for all appear at the top of the image in white with orange outlining versus fun for all. Personally, I would do a alt text in that circumstance as fun for all. Um, there's really not a, when you're doing alt text, you want it to be relevant to the email. It doesn't have to actually describe the, uh, the image that it's on. You want it to, be, to, you want to include alt text that brings, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, message, you know, uh, all together, you know, for, uh, for, for the image. You want to kind of, for whatever block it's in, 
like, uh, you know, you want to have it be related to whatever text is around it. Great. And then for role equals button, is this for both buttons that are coded as live text and buttons that are images? Well, all buttons should be live buttons, but if you can't do that um, and you have to use images, uh, then yes, you still need to have role equals button on, on the actual um, A tag. Great, and then the next question is from Lauren. Also, are there free screen reader programs available on the internet or how do we get this feature to test emails? So I am using a Mac and I use VoiceOver to help uh, you know, f f um, see, to test how a screen reader is going to actually sound to people who use it. So um, I'm, I bet you anything there is a PC, uh, you know, version of voiceover probably, but um, yeah, I know for sure it's built into um, the accessibility standards of a um, of the operating system that Mac uses. Great. And then Jacob had a question. Any tips on how to bal balance capabilities such as real-time image personalization with Excel accessibility features? And should there be an alt text default in that scenario? Yeah, you should definitely have a uh, default um, alt text. If you have to, if you're using something uh, like movable ink or whatever that's uh, that's generating a custom image, you, if you can use um, like a token for the name, you know, if, if you are able to use like the first name token, uh, use that in the alt text. But if you can't. Um, then just use uh, like uh, whatever it, uh, the rest of the text that's in there and maybe just instead of having, you know, and you have um, subscriber or valued person or something like that. Great. And then Lucy said, you've talked about live text. What about live text that is overlaying a background, background image? Are there any concerns with that? Uh, no, <laughs> no, there's not really. Um, I mean, you should be using live text over background images and, um, that yeah, is, uh, you, you, the accessibility of using background, uh, images with text on top is a whole lot more accessible than, uh, than putting, um, the text as part of the back, uh, as part of the image. So if you can, definitely try to use um, background images with text on top. That's way more accessible. I hope that answered the question. Great. And then Marie had a follow up question. Also, she read. She said, "I also read that if an image is decorative and not important to the copy, that the alt text should be left blank." Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. You should, you should have ALT equals and then just two parentheses, not anything in it. So that tells um, screen readers, hey, this is an image, but it's not like necessary. Uh, you know, it, it's there for decorative or structural, uh, you know, reasons. Great. And then Dar Darlene would like to know why do we want to remove title properties? So title properties are, so when you hover over um, like links and stuff, the little uh, thing that shows up, little box that has uh, text in it, that's what a title does. And I actually have not done enough research on this to be able to guide you either way. I have heard um, both, you know, um, both sides of, of this, of, you know, taking off, off title and uh, some that, you know, really feel like you need to keep it there. So I uh, guess stay tuned and <laughs> contact me. I'll do some research and you can, uh, you know, uh, tweet me or whatever. Sorry, I don't have that. Great. Thank you, Anne. Um, and if we don't have any more questions, I think we've answered all of them. Um, we can go ahead and announce the, oh, it looks like Sai has a question, maybe. Oh, he's just saying, caution, title is an image. 
tag is different from the main title tag in the header. So. Oh, that's very true. Um, if there aren't any other questions that are coming through, we can go ahead and announce the winners for the giveaway. Um, and the winners are Emily Wong and Sai Kamuth. Um, so Allie will be reaching out to you to get your um, swag over to you. And we have just a couple month, minutes left if anybody else has any questions. Feel free to I check. actually see in. here that somebody has said that background images may not appear in Outlooks on Windows. Uh, you do, you can do that. You ha just have to do it in VML. So um, there's, you can, what you have to do with Windows 10, if this person is, is talking about Windows 10 specifically, um, you, if images on top of a background image in Outlook Windows 10, you have to substitute a VML image uh, and hide it for from everything but Outlook. So you can do it, it's just gonna take a little bit more effort. Great, thank you, Anne. All right, thank you everyone for attending. And um, as I mentioned early, earlier, we will be sending out the link to the recording to this um, after the session. So thank you. Bye, thank you everyone. Okay. Thanks.